Hi. Um, so, hello. Um, this is my launch, which means I am A, very nervous, and B, going to start with a few thank yous to everybody who helped make this happen. Um, so, first of all, thank you all to coming out for coming out. Um, thanks to The Strand for hosting. Um, you can all hear me, right, in the back? Okay. Um, thanks to everyone who helped make this book happen. Um, my agent, Jenny Ferrari-Adler, my publicist, Megan Harris. Um, my amazing and very brave editor, Allison Callahan, um, my publishers, Amy Bell and Jen Bergstrom, and everyone at Scout and SNS. Um, on a more personal note, it has been an incredible year, a year in which all of my dreams came true, um, in which I also died of terror and exhaustion 20 times and then came back to life. And the reason I am still alive and here in front of you right now is because of a lot of the people in this room. Um, I want to say thanks so much to my family, um, Alyssa, Martin, and Erica, um, my mom, Carol, my dad, Armin, who came all the way from Alaska to be here, um, my friends who came from all over, and um, Haley for agreeing to be in conversation with me, and then finally, I want to thank my girlfriend, Callie, who has been with me every step of the way, and I truly could not have done it without her. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Um, so I thought a lot about what to read here and um, I had a few different options but most of them ranged from rated R to rated NC-17 and like I said my dad is here <laughs> so that cut it down a little bit um, but I picked I think I'm gonna read the beginning of the last book and the last story in the collection um, it's a story called Biter and uh, yeah I think it's pretty self-explanatory so I'll just get right in Biter. Ellie was a biter. She bit other kids in preschool, bit her cousins, bit her mom. By the time she was four years old, she was going to a special doctor twice a week to work on biting. At the doctor's, Ellie made two dolls bite each other, and then the dolls talked about how biting and being bitten made them feel. Ouch, one said. Sorry, said the other. I feel sad about that said the one. I feel happy, said the other, but sorry again. She brainstormed lists of things she could do instead of biting, like raise her hand and ask for help, or take a deep breath and count to 10. At the doctor's suggestion, Ellie's parents put a chart on Ellie's bedroom door, and Ellie's mom put a gold star on it for every day that Ellie didn't bite. But Ellie loved biting, even more than she loved gold stars. And she kept on biting, joyfully and fiercely, until one day after preschool, pretty Katie Davis pointed at Ellie and whispered loudly to her dad, that one's Ellie. No one likes her. She bites people. And Ellie felt so sick with shame, she didn't bite anyone again for more than 20 years. As an adult, Though her active biting days were long behind her, Ellie still indulged in daydreams in which she stalked her coworkers around the office, biting them. For example, she imagined sneaking into the copy room where Thomas Whittacombe was collating reports, so engrossed in his task that he didn't notice Ellie creeping up behind him on all fours. Ellie, what on earth, Thomas Whittacombe would cry in the final seconds before Ellie sunk her teeth into his plump and hairy calf. For while the world had succeeded in shaming Ellie out of biting, it couldn't make her forget the joy of tiptoeing behind Robbie Ketrick while he was standing at the craft table, smugly stacking blocks. Everything is normal, quiet, boring. Then here comes Ellie, chomp. Now Robbie Ketrick is screaming like a baby, and everybody is scrambling and yelling, and Ellie is no longer just a little girl, but a wild creature, pacing the halls of the preschool, sowing chaos and destruction in her wake. The difference between adults and children is that adults understand the consequences of their actions. And Ellie, as an adult, understood that if she wanted to pay her rent and keep her health insurance, she could not run around biting people at work. Therefore, for a long time, Ellie did not seriously consider biting her coworkers, not until the office manager died of a heart attack at lunch in front of everyone and the temp agency sent Corey Allen to replace him. Corey Allen. Later, Ellie's coworkers would ask each other, what on earth had the people at the temp agency been thinking sending him? 
green-eyed, blonde-haired, pink-cheeked Corey Allen did not belong in an office environment. Corey Allen, like a fawn or a satyr, belonged in a sunlit field surrounded by happy naked nymphs making love and drinking wine. As Michelle in accounting put it, Corey Allen gave off the impression that he might, at any second, decide to quit being an office manager and run off to live in a tree. Ellie, who was something of an outcast at work, often walked in on hushed conversations about Corey Allen that presumably centered around how much the other women in the office wanted to sleep with him. Corey Allen was beautiful and fey. Ellie didn't want to have sex with Corey Allen. Ellie wanted to bite him hard. She discovered this while watching Corey Allen place glazed donuts on a platter before the Monday morning meeting. When he had finished arranging the donuts, he turned around and, noticing her staring at him, winked. Why, Ellie, you look hungry, he said with a leer. Ellie had not been checking out Corey Allen the way he seemed to be implying. She hadn't even been thinking about the donuts. But suddenly, she found herself imagining what it would be like to lock her jaws into the soft part of Corey Allen's neck. Corey Allen would yelp and sink to his knees, that entitled look wiped right off his face. He'd slap weakly at her and cry, oh no, Ellie, stop, please, what is going on? But Ellie wouldn't answer because her mouth would be too full of Corey Allen's sweet and gamey flesh. Not that it had to be his neck. She wasn't picky about location. She could bite Corey Allen on his hand, or his face, or his elbow, or his ass. Each would have a different taste, a different mouthfeel, a different proportion of bone to fat to skin. Each would be, in its own way, delectable. Maybe I will bite Corey Allen, Ellie thought after the meeting. Ellie worked in communications, which meant that she spent 90% of her time crafting emails that no one ever read. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, she had a savings account and life insurance, but no lover, no ambition, no close friends. Her entire existence, she sometimes felt, was premised on the idea that pursuing pleasure was less important than avoiding pain. Perhaps the problem with adulthood was that you weighed the consequences of your actions too carefully in a way that left you with a life you despised. What if Ellie did bite, what if Ellie did bite Corey Allen? What if she did? What then? That night, Ellie changed into her nicest pajamas, lit a candle, and poured herself a glass of Cabernet. Then she uncapped a pen, opened her favorite notebook, and turned to a fresh page. Reasons not to bite Corey Allen. One, it is wrong. <laughs> two, I could get in trouble. She nibbled on the tip of her pen that added two subsidiary points. Reasons not to bite Corey Allen. One, it is wrong. Two, I could get in trouble. A, I could get fired. B, I could get arrested and or fined. Ellie thought, if it meant that I could bite Corey, I would not mind getting fired. <laughs> For the past year and a half, she'd spent most of her lunch hour, most days, on her phone, swiping through job postings on monster.com. She was ready for a new position and felt perfectly well qualified for one. However, finding a new job after you'd been fired from your old one was not, or sorry. However, finding a new job after quitting your old one was not the same as finding a new job after you'd been fired from your old job for biting. Would it be impossible to get a new job in those circumstances or merely very difficult? It was hard to know. Ellie sipped her wine and turned her attention to B, I could get arrested and or fined. Well, that was certainly a possibility. But the truth was that if a woman bit a man in an office environment, there would be a strong assumption that the man had done something to deserve it. If, for example, she went up to Corey and bit him in full view of everyone at Monday morning meeting, and then later, when they asked her why she'd done it, she answered sexual gratification, then yes, she'd probably be arrested. <laughs> but if instead, she bit Corey in private, say in the copy room, and when they asked her why she'd done it, she said, he tried to touch me inappropriately, or even so as not to mar her, his reputation, he came up behind me and scared me, I bit him instinctively, I'm so sorry, then people would probably give her the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> when you got right down to it, as a young white woman without a criminal record, Ellie probably had at least one get out of jail free card. As long as she spun some semi-reasonable story, she would be believed. 
In fact, Ellie thought, as she stretched out her legs and refilled her glass of wine, there was another possibility for how all this could play out. What if she went up to Corey in private and bit him, and the experience was so bizarre that he didn't tell anyone about it because he had trouble believing it himself? Imagine, it's late in the afternoon, past five, dark already. The office is empty. Everyone but Corey and Ellie has gone home. Corey is loading paper into the Xerox machine when Ellie enters the room. She stands beside him, inappropriately close. He thinks he knows what is coming. He stiffens, preparing to politely reject her, not because he has standards for workplace propriety, but because he's already hooking up with Rachel in HR. Ellie, he begins apologetically as she grabs his forearm and lifts it to her mouth. Corey's lovely face contorts first in shock, then pain. Stop it, Ellie, he cries, but no one hears him. The tendons of his arm roll and snap beneath Ellie's jaws. Finally, Corey gathers his wits enough to shove Ellie away. She stumbles backwards, lands against the stacks of copy paper, and slides to the ground. Corey stares at her in horror, clutching his bleeding arm. He's waiting for her explanation, but she gives him none. Instead, she stands up calmly, straightens her skirt, and wipes the blood from her mouth before she leaves the room. What does Corey do? Of course, he could run straight to HR and say, Ellie bit me, but after all, it was an office, not a preschool. Everything about the conversation would be ridiculous. Ellie, did you bite Corey, they would ask, and Ellie would raise her eyebrows and say, uh, no, what a weird question. <laughs> If the HR people tried to push and said, Ellie, these are serious allegations, all Ellie would have to say was, yeah, seriously insane. Of course I did not bite the office manager, and I don't know why he's saying that I did. Really, the odds were high that Corey wouldn't say anything at all. He would stay in the copy room for a while, contemplating the situation, and then the next day, he'd decide that the easiest thing to do would be to pretend it hadn't happened. He'd show up to work in a long-sleeved shirt to cover the ugly bruise on his arm, the little half-moon where she'd marked him with her teeth. And then, part of Corey Allen's brain would be reserved for keeping track of where exactly Ellie was. <laughs> she'd catch him looking at her in meetings, and when they were at office parties together, he'd continually be moving, trying to keep as far as possible away from her. In a way, it'd be like they were always dancing, even if they, he never spoke to her again. Months later, when no one else was watching, she'd grin and snap her jaws at him, <laughs> and he'd turn ghost pale and hurry from the room. He would remember her for the rest of his life. They'd be joined by the glistening strands of his fear. Later that night, the sweat drying on her body, her legs tangled in the sheets, Ellie forced herself to go back out to the living room and get her notebooks. Fantasies were fantasies, but it was important to keep at le least one foot in the realm of the real. She got back in bed and opened the notebook and rewrote her list. Reasons not to bite Corey Allen. One, it is wrong. Two, it is wrong. Three, it is wrong. Four, it is wrong. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much for reading that terrifying story and for writing. <laughs> Just a piece. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for writing that book. It gets even better from there. Um, so you shall keep reading. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I've been lucky enough to read the book a few times now, and I was sort of surprised uh, that I've only just had a nightmare based on one <laughs> okay. of your stories just uh -huh. this weekend on Saturday night. Which one was it? The what matchbot happened? sign. Okay. Matchbot sign. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't talk about it because okay. I'm so <laughs> ashamed and embarrassed by what my subconscious did with that story. It oh was boy. truly disgusting. All right, well, um, write your own. <laughs> so I guess my first question is, how dare you? Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Some people have asked me that for sure. Yeah. Um, I don't know, man. I love a story that gets in my head enough that it gives me nightmares. That's yeah, yeah. my personal <laughs> sweet spot, actually. So. Yeah, how are yeah. you sleeping these days? I sleep great, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Once I write them down, they're out of my head, then they go into yours. Yeah, yeah, totally. totally. Yeah. But more, more seriously, yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of these stories seem to deal with emotions or experiences that I would say we spend our conscious hours maybe like actively 
were pressing or mm -hmm. suppressing. When you start writing a story like this, do you start from trying to bring that feeling to the surface, or is it more you start from the situation and work your way down? I would say usually I start with something kind of itching at me, yeah. actually speaking of the matchbox sign, just something that's bothering me but I can't quite articulate why, yeah. some kind of fear or negative emotion or something that's made me angry, um, and often the process of writing the story is of digging kind of deeper into that and trying to identify it and then maybe twist it and push it until it's like taken on a shape of its own. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like you're writing through the experience. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Capturing it. Yeah. And do you find yourself like returning to material that gives you that feeling personally, like books or movies? In yeah. Particular? Oh, yeah, for yeah. sure. As a reader um, and a movie watcher, I am a huge horror fan. I love anything that's within the horror genre and then anything that sort of spreads out into stuff that will make me uncomfortable and a little bit and unable to forget it is like exactly what I'm looking for something that kind of sticks in my head and then comes back to me in nightmares is exactly what mm -hmm. um, I'm looking for yeah yeah any yeah. particular nightmares anything that like recurs oh, over and over you again you know I've never been one to have a recurring dream mm -hmm. um, I body stuff always gets to me for sure um, I often, I have like, there's a difference between a nightmare and an anxiety dream. And I feel like I'd much, I'd a hundred times rather have a nightmare, mm -hmm. an anxiety dream where I'm just trying to grade papers or something is way <laughs> worse. At least you, uh, you wake up in the morning, happy your nightmare isn't true, but usually your anxiety dream kind of, you do actually have to grade those papers. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. How does it feel in the moment of writing it? Like, do you feel calm because you have control over the experience or is it the reverse? Like yeah. it's right on the surface. I would say often the process of writing a story is for me a kind of fever dream where I'm writing it really intensely. It's all I can think of. It's kind of exhausting. I'm really focusing it and then on it. And then in the aftermath, I feel kind of purged and free. And there are experiences that have happened to me that, you know, Nothing I write is like directly autobiographical, autobiographical. Um, but sometimes the thing that inspired it after I write a story will feel kind of trapped in that like space of the story, and mm -hmm. it'll feel much farther away than it did when I first started writing. Mm -hmm. That doesn't always happen, um, but sometimes that can be a happy consequence that it just sort of seems more like a story than real life after the process of writing is done. Yeah. Yeah, I've um, read you say in other interviews that you think there's like somewhere between a five to ten year yeah. lag <laughs> in between when something happens to you in life and when it shows up in your fiction. Yeah. How does that timing change your perspective on those situations? Is it that you need the five to ten years or like? Yeah, like I think that generally when I'm writing a story, I think that if I have something that I really want to say and that if I really care whether people read the story right and get like what I mean, that story is due because it's like I can't let go of it enough to put it in the world. It's like I might as well write an essay because I care too much about other people reading it. And the process of writing a story is like so different because you put it in, you put the space, you put the characters on the page, you make yeah. create the events and then you give it to people and they interpret it in a thousand different ways and you have I think you can tell a story and I certainly have written ones where the the desire to control the the reader is is too much present mm -hmm. and you want people to get it so much that you can't let the story be what it naturally needs to be. Mm -hmm. So I usually do need some distance um, on events before I can turn them into fiction. Oh, that's, yeah. that's interesting. I'm putting away my questions. I'm going to ask a different question <laughs> oh, now. Okay. What is the danger there in trying to control too much of a reader's experience? Like, Why do you think it has to stay open for the reader? I mean, I think it will stop feeling surprising. Mm -hmm. I think that also stories, I mean, I don't know. It, it, for me, and this is much more subjective, just it's a different part of my brain. Mm -hmm. Like the part that's telling stories and inventing things and sort of in that kind of messy space is a different part of my brain than my analytical brain. And so it's actually been really funny as I've started the publicity and whatnot for the book to be trying to explain the stories to people when almost always the answer is like, I don't know. I don't know what I was <laughs> thinking. I don't know why I wrote it. I don't know what it means. You do that. Because I do feel like that's the reader's experience is to take a story and to to unpack its meaning and to make a claim about it. And like, I love doing that as a reader. It's my favorite thing to do. I feel like I'm the worst interpreter of my own stories. Mm. Yeah.
Mm. Mm. Um, yeah, we've spoken in the past. We well, we taught for a profile in Elle magazine, which you guys should all yeah. pick up. Please support print media. I look great <laughs> in my picture, so <laughs> you should definitely a, get it. It's the most flattering picture of me yeah. that will ever be taken in the history Kristen, of pictures. Yeah, Kristen had to look wear like a winter coat tall. in August. <laughs> yeah. Was it August when it we met? It really was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh -huh. yeah, she worked so hard for everybody. I did. Yeah, um, enjoy it. But yeah, we talked a little bit about how, in relation to le leaving it open for a reader, you really work to hold back on too many identifying details in mm -hmm. a story, which is the type of thing that I really felt when I was reading it, but I wasn't consciously aware of. Like, there's not a lot about where people are in the world or what they look like or those sorts of like traditional identifying markers. Um, how open do you try to leave those stories? Like, do you do you need some parameters in order to like contain that experience? Yeah, I would say it really varies story to story. That there are some that are much more firmly grounded in a particular time and place, and then others that float like much sort of higher above the real world. Um, and I guess, yeah, I mean, it's it's a phrase that I used in an essay that I wrote the other day. It was like narrative scaffolding. Like I want you to be able to slide into the story. I want you to like have enough that you feel situated. You don't feel like you're floating in space. But that then like absorption is a feeling I think about a lot in terms of what I want from a story to be able to just kind of like fill in enough of the gaps that my imagination is, or that the reader's imagination is doing as much work as I am as the writer. Because I think otherwise you could watch you could watch television. You could do something else where all the details are provided for you. But I think choosing just the right ones so like you're carried forward, but leaving enough out that the world that's being created is specific to the reader, I think, makes for a much, can feel like much more personal and sort of like individual in a kind of surprising way than if you try and explain, so this person was born on 19, you know, in 1947 <laughs> and like looks like this and does like this, yeah. you know, then, then it's mine, it's not yours. Yeah, and it's sort of telling, like it really was only on maybe my second or third read of Cat Person mm -hmm. specifically, um, where when I went back looking for what I thought I knew, right. it really wasn't there, it was in my head. Um, is that the essay you were referring to when you're talking about people trying to look for real life Partly, elements? yeah, I yeah. mean, just because that's the one I have experience with people reading, yeah, but I yeah. can imagine that it's true um, in all of them in one way or the other. Um, and I think with Cat Person in particular, there's the sort of confusing and slightly tri tricky double bind where everything you know about Robert is through is via Margot. So there are a lot of hints about what he might be like, but she's doing so much filling in the blanks and she's so convinced of its truth herself that people still do come up to me and say like, oh, I thought of him as this and this, or even, you know, he was like this. And I'm like, well, was he? <laughs> like, <laughs> um, and so that, yeah, I think is a, is a sort of second layer, right? That any other characters in the story are filtered through the POV of whoever the, the main character is. Yeah, and that does seem to be a theme that runs through the rest of the stories of the book, like, um, I think the good guy mm -hmm. is right after Cat Person, and that's obviously not the inverse of Cat Person by any means, but that's a man who believes that he can sort of read minds, right? That he knows what other women are thinking about him, and he uses that to like read them, I guess. Yeah. Is that fair to say? Definitely. Like, yeah. And I think that is one of the things that I write because it's something that I know. That I am a person who is so proud of my own empathetic skills and is so ready to be like, I understand everything about you. And like <laughs> often I'm using that skill for good in my day to day life, but I'm also very aware of how like we talk about empathy as this like this inherently valuable quality when really all it is is speculating about things that we don't know and there's no reason why it has to be used for good you can use your you can use empathy for evil right totally. like and we see i think in the book um, lots of examples where people either yeah use it for negative like to get what they want or use it and don't realize they're using it and sort of mistaking their own visions of other people for reality and then facing the consequences of that Totally. I just, um, I read The Friend last oh, week. Oh, yeah, I love yeah, that book. Yeah, it's so good. Yeah. Um, and there's that paragraph, like, maybe in, like, the first or second chapter where she says something like, um, reading gives you empathy, but writing takes it away. Yeah, And totally. I definitely, like, just collapsed right totally. into myself. Yeah. <laughs> that's, ouch. Right. Like, but there's something is, like, I mean, it's not, I don't know if I agree with this idea that it's somehow hostile to enforce your view of the world through writing onto a reader. Right, right. But it is limiting. Right yeah. when it's through your vantage point, right, and it's a t it's a seizing of control, right? Yes. Like it's so much about like 
giving a tailored perspective of the world, but somehow being persuasive enough that people, for at least through the duration they're reading your story, are like, oh, this is right. Like, this yeah, makes yeah. sense. And then sometimes maybe surface and are like, where, what? I don't believe those things. I don't agree with that. I don't identify or empathize with this person. But if the story has worked, you did for that minute. You were sort of swept up in that spell. Yeah. Um, and that's sort of a good like, lead into something else I want to talk yeah. to you about, which is that there's this theme of power throughout the book. Definitely. Who has it and yeah. who wants it. Um, but it's also a way of distinguishing the difference between power and control. Ooh, I don't even know that I can quite do That's a tough question. What do you think the difference is, Haley? <laughs> no, no, no. This is your interview. It's your What is lunch. the difference between power and control? God. I didn't say there would be a quiz. Um, I guess control... I don't know. I mean, I think controlling others is certain an, certainly an aspect of power. And often, I think, when we are exerting power, I'm going to kind of sidestep the question, if that's OK, because yes. I don't know the answer. <laughs> um, when, we start, when we're trying to exert control over other people, we, uh, what we want is control. And often, when we are trying to control people, we think we are doing it for their own good or because it will um, you know, we're rarely thinking, when all of our attempts to control, we rarely define to ourselves as exercises of power. We really say, I need power over this person, and that's why I'm going to tell him exactly how he should live his life and, like, everything that he's doing wrong. We don't think of it that way, but it's what we're doing. And I think control, I mean, the, the need for control, just like the need for power, is so justifiable. And it's so clearly rooted in the fact that there are so many things that we can't control in this life, and that the few things we can um, become very precious to us. But that so rarely are the things we control can control other people, right? Like, peop other people are almost entirely beyond our fundamental control. And like the inability to truly grasp that and how much we do to sort of avoid recognizing how little control we have over pe other people, I think, is in one of the sort of core dynamics that I recognize. And I feel like that the book is really interested in pushing at and trying to figure out. Now, will you tell me what the difference between power and I control don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel like it's one of those, you know, it's like a meditation. Yeah. We'll all go home and we'll right. think Maybe on it. Maybe someone here knows they yeah. can tell us in the Q&A. <laughs> but do you feel a sense of control, you know, in a world full of chaos, to quote Cher Horowitz? Um, mm -hmm. But do you feel a sense of control when you're writing? Or is it is it a way of giving yeah. up control <laughs> to tell the story? Um, I don't feel super in control when yeah. I'm writing. I mean, I think maybe I feel powerful and I don't feel in control. Is mm. that true? Like, I do feel like I'm not, when a story is going well, I feel like it's getting away from me or like it's always about to. I'm not one of those people who's like, oh, the characters just do what they want. I don't know. It's not like <laughs> that. It's not mystical. But it does feel like something is happening that is slightly beyond me or that I'm like being surprised. And so that is a feeling, I feel like I'm kind of riding a wave. So riding a wave maybe would be a good example of when you are sort of, not, you're not quite in control, but you're also sort of like powered by it. And then that's the feeling I would say I have yeah, writing yeah. a story. Yeah, because you sort of know what a wave is going to do, but yeah. it can still right. take it's you. Still much stronger than you yeah, are, yeah. you could immediately be sunk if you make the wrong choice. So. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and I know that you studied psychology as well as yeah, English, yeah. which was... Deep dive into my background. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, you told me. I did. Um, and also, <laughs> also unsurprising, yeah, once you've read uh -huh. the book, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really gets in there into the it and the ego. Um, but we talked a little bit about this sort of... Um, you had mentioned this idea of narrativization within mm -hmm. a diagnosis like about how in medicine, mm. like, yeah, doctors are taught not to impose their own stories onto a patient just uh -huh. because of cluster of systems. You know my dad's this. a doctor, and he's oh, in the cool. audience right now, and if I say <laughs> this wrong, he's going to be so <laughs> mad. But, like, doctors do not do that, Kristen. They're objective observers. <laughs> we welcome yeah. a fat chat at uh -huh. any point. Thank you so much yeah. for being here. No, sorry. Um, <laughs> say, your, say, your, say the question again so I can Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, you had mentioned, like, this idea that there's a danger to narrativizing mm -hmm. when a patient comes up with a cluster of symptoms thinking that you already know what it's going to be, what uh -huh. that endpoint is. Yeah, yeah. Um, is that the same principle that you're writing with, with these stories, when you hold back between power and control? Yeah, maybe. I mean, that's deeper than, that's more elegant than I would have put it. But yeah, um, I think, sure. I think the story, the idea that the stories we tell about other people can often really mislead us mm -hmm. and can both help us get to a diagnosis, get to an understanding, but can also take us in really surprising and sort of 
um, mysterious directions is absolutely a theme of the story. And like Matchbox Sign, the story that gave you nightmares, Ugh. is exactly <laughs> about that, right? Is about a woman who has a constellation of symptoms and everyone has a story about what those symptoms mean. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think in conclusion, yes. Yes. You're right. <laughs> Um, and then to go back to something you mentioned earlier about, you know, when you go into a different medium, such as yeah. television, yeah. everything's laid out for you. A lot of these stories are about to be adapted for a television yeah. show. Fingers crossed. Yeah. And you yeah. are also working on a screenplay. Yep. Um, how does your work change when you go between these mediums? Do you think of it more visually or is it the same process of sketching it out? I do think of it, I have only started begin, like edging into screenwriting, but I do feel like it feels weirdly freeing because for me always stories about getting down the like daydream in my head that there's some process of going from it's fully realized in my brain and then figuring out how to translate that experience to other people who are trying to read and I think with screenwriting there's been this sort of delightful process where I can just be like well I'm sure they'll figure that out you know <laughs> like there's a monster it looks very scary <laughs> figure it out <laughs> um, and I know what it looks like and I you know put down what really matters to me but I do think I think I really am drawn to collaborative work my friend actually that I'm working on a screenplay with is here right now and the idea of like having someone that you can practice bouncing those ideas off of and like helping each other imagine things to me that's so much like the relationship between the reader and the writer that um, it's really lovely to imagine a movie being made by everyone at once and like I love the idea of a like a writer's room in television where like there's this collective story I think we have a have an idea of like the writer you know tortured and alone and not talking to anyone for months and like that appeals to me too sometimes but like the game of imagination I think is core to writing and and I don't know translates to all these different media yeah, and it, well, I mean, it goes back to what you were saying before about these stories, too, where you do have people who want you to explain what it means, and yep. that's sort of their job. Like, that's the job of everybody here who's going to yeah. buy the book and go home and read right. it tonight. So no questions. Yeah. Just figure <laughs> no. it out yourself. <laughs> Lots of questions, yeah. but it's like you can be surprised by yeah. someone else's Absolutely. reading. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's ha because I have been surprised like that, because I have seen people read my stories in workshop or after they've been published and give such nuanced and thoughtful explanations of what what the story might mean that I am hesitant to show up and explain it because I feel like then I'm going to cut off you know all of the kind of conversation that would have happened in my absence and I think you know then the consequence is you have to accept all the interpretations that you think are completely wrong right and you just sort of have to let them go but I think it's worth it right I think it's worth it giving the story to an audience and letting it kind of breathe and be used by them as they see fit yeah is there like like not a playlist exactly, but is there like a film festival that accompanies this book? Maybe like movies that people should watch oh my God. to get into the mood for it? Um, yeah, I guess. God, I mean, I feel like I should give a list of a mix of books and movies that I watched during my formative years because that's the, those are the ones that kind of seep in the most dramatically. Um, I was a huge Stephen King fan. People are, yeah, it's, it's I mean, I, I was a huge Stephen King fan, but I also loved like Harriet the Spy, like any book about a girl being kind of difficult and slightly <laughs> gross, but also wonderful <laughs> was my favorite kind of story. Um, and then in terms of movies, um, the one that just came to mind, like there's a children's movie was The Never Ending Story, which is about just getting so sucked into a story that you can't find your way out. And I feel like that is something that shaped my brain at a really crucial moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So watch that. And then watch a bunch of slasher movies just so like <laughs> at the afterwards you feel like, okay, I can handle anything. You can read the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and how has your writing changed since you've been seeing these responses? I'm just, I'm personally curious. Yeah, I, I mean, it's tough. Like, in some ways, like... I wrote Cat Person, which is like when I got like an avalanche of responses to my story. Like I've been writing stories for a fair, for quite a while, and like in workshop, I've all, one thing that has became really clear to me um, early on was that people loved them or hated them. And so when Cat Person came out and people loved it and hated it, I was like, "Yep, <laughs> that's how that goes." Um, and I think I, it's. 
I don't know. I mean, it, it's hard. I think I'm changing as a writer still. I think you can see that in the stories that are newer, which are do actually all happen to be the more realist stories. So in this collection, um, there it's Cat Person, the novella, the good guy, and the story, the Death Wish, at story Death Wish. I think have a lot of the trappings of genre, but are moving in a more realist space, and maybe that that's something that as I got more confident in my own ability. I care a lot about plot. Like it's just something that like when you're in an FFA, people, some professors are very helpful. <laughs> and one of them is here at helping you figure out. But that I a lot of in a lot of ways felt like I had to like take apart myself to learn how to put together a story that will like carry you through it really quickly and powerfully. And so that horror in particular was a really helpful tool to just be like, if the reader is tense and anxious and like paying attention and turning the page, it's working. And that's all you're going for at the beginning. And then you start adding in layers of psychological observation or social com or anything else. But like the core has to be, I think, a story that makes you want to turn the page. And I learned a lot from genre reading and writing in that way. And I think now I still have that, but it's possible that like I feel confident enough in it that I'm able to do other things and that there are stories in which much less like, and I think Cat Person is one of them, where much less ostensibly happens, but you're powered forward by that same feeling of tension. So I don't know, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And I, you know, I was thinking when we were like getting ready to do this that I sometimes take for granted that stories that are done in the horror genre are going to be about the experience of feeling fear uh -huh. or like the way fear functions between yeah, people. Yeah. But actually that's the difference between what makes you turn the page, what makes you go, oh, that's so fate. Because uh -huh. so much of it is like just violence or just that sort of of like getting under the skin feeling for its own sake. Um, but yeah, when it's about what fear makes you do mm -hmm. or the way it like changes your logic, it yeah. is such a different experience exactly. for the reader. Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. I think um, one of the things I wanted the stories to do was to keep you a little unsettled in terms of where you were in genre, that you didn't know what the stakes were, mm -hmm. that the possibly the stakes were very, very high and that things were you know, going to move into that terrifying direction, but also that they might not and what would happen would be a bad date you know, or a fight. And I think when you truly don't know, you're in, like, then the opportunities are kind of endless. And hopefully yeah. it's, like, a really a rewarding space to be in 12 separate times, especially in a story collection where you've got to go through that same arc 12 different times. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think we're going to move into some questions, if that's OK. Um, it's OK with me. Is it OK yeah. with you? <laughs> um, we've got a microphone going around. If anybody is brave, oh, oh boy, we got one. Um, hi, I read somewhere, I think maybe in the L interview, that you like Shirley Jackson. So I was wondering if you saw the Netflix show and what you thought about it. Oh yeah, I love Shirley Jackson. I have seen the first two episodes, and I will not fully throw my girlfriend under the bus. But we were watching them together, and there was a scene with a cat, a kitten, that we turned it off and have not actually gone back to <laughs> since. <laughs> um, I loved it. I, I did feel like. It, w it was really different than the book. And I love that book so much that it maybe was hard for me to fully get on board with the new version of a story that had so many like men in it and like that, that were so, um, that just had a tone that I thought was really distinct and powerful, but so different from the book. It was a really melancholy show. It was a really sad show. And I, I think of Shirley Jackson as someone who like, even when she's ripping her heart out, is kind of, is laughing kind of darkly at the same time. And I missed that kind of like dark cackle in the, in the first couple episodes that I want. But um, I'll, I'll probably give it another shot. I've got a lot of plane rides coming up, so we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? I've got one. Sure. Oh. What's what's your next project? Oh boy. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've got a couple different things going on. Um, I owe a novel to my publishers, and I'm working on it. Um, I'm the kind of person who usually has a couple different projects going at the same time. So I have a few different things that I'm working on, and I'm also working on um, a screenplay. So I think, I mean, I think truly, I will need to do a pretty big retreat into myself after all of this. It's been, like I said, quite a year um, but I am really excited to get back and start just like being alone with my imagination again so yeah we'll see that's all I want to say yeah so in there oh. yeah here you go 
Hi, so when Cat Person came out, I actually sent it to my professor, uh -huh. and she thought that it was super interesting that people assumed it was nonfiction. How uh -huh. did you feel about that? Because we discuss it a lot in class, how often pieces of writing are assumed to be something when it's important that it is fiction. Yeah, um, that was, yeah, it was a very disorienting feeling. I mean, everything that happened with Cat Person, like, truly happened over a weekend. And before that weekend started, I was, you know, an MFA, a recent MFA graduate who was very excited, you know, when someone liked my stories in workshop and when my story had gotten into the New Yorker was over the moon. And then like over the course of that weekend, there was this explosion of conversation. And actually I like, when we were talking about this, like I couldn't take it in all at once. Like I had to close my computer. I had to step away. And so when I came back to it, what I found first were a lot of think pieces actually sort of scolding the readers of Cat Person for not understanding Cat Person. And I was like, oh, did that happen like I don't know um, and I think I don't know I have mixed feelings it's very hard and it still happens often where people I'm 37 and people will just be like oh like are you assume that I'm in my mid-20s or assume that I'm still a student or like do little things where I'm like you're still kind of mixing me up with Margo aren't you um, but I think I don't know I, I find I think I'm glad that I didn't have to answer the most direct questions or like engage so directly with people while they were having those really intense conversations. But there is a part of me that like feels like, especially people who were mistaking it for nonfiction as they were passionately discussing the story, I, I like I have a temptation to kind of give them a pass for that because I feel like the truth is when we're not in English class, often we do that, all of us. We like imagine the characters and then we also imagine a writer to go with it and we have conversation based on those things we are imagining and like, you know, if you're caught up in a passionate conversation about my story and I've managed to be transparent enough that you can't tell the difference between me and my fiction, I feel like that's an almost enough of a compliment to me that I'm not going to you know, hit you over the head with it. I think once you've had some time to think about it, if you're like, you know, active, you're direct, you're addressing me now a year later, like, of course. And like, it is, it's a very confusing thing. Like we all read really differently now. And I think we haven't quite figured out how to have the kinds of conversations about fiction that we're used to having face-to-face -face and one-on-one -on -one with strangers on the internet. Um, and so I think that's an ongoing process um, and certainly in many ways could be better. But I do think, I don't know, it's just, people were passionate about a story. Young women particularly were passionate about a story. I think telling them that they were reading the story wrong feels a little rough. The men who sent me really mean emails, <laughs> them I blame. <laughs> but generally, the readers, I think I can, I don't know, I have mixed feelings about it, I guess. Yeah. Well, you know, like um, that story that I found when I was researching this from Shirley Jackson, I found really horrifying. I don't know if you want to share it with the room if people aren't familiar. Or you, you mean the lot, the what happened after yeah, the lottery? With the letters that the New Yorker got. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I mean that you probably will tell it better than I would. But yeah, when the when the lottery came out in the New Yorker, people wrote her dozens of letters, and there's a really great biography of her called A Rather Haunted Life that I strongly recommend if you are a Shirley Jackson or Haunting of Hill House fan, um, where they pull some excerpts, and it is so funny how like ready they are to scold her and be like, this story has no meaning and I don't understand why people are still conducting this ritual of stoning in this day and age, you know? <laughs> how, how could you not describe it so, like, you know, calmly when it's a clearly an outrage? Um, so it's a, it's a, it has a long history in people of misreading and then wanting to yell at the author of a story for a, something they have misread. Um, and then there were some people who wanted to know where they could go see one exactly. of these lotteries. And yeah. that's when I was, like, closed yeah, tap. Like, exactly. People too re far. reveal a lot when, yeah. they've, when they've read your story and have strong feelings about it for yeah. both better and for worse, I think. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Anybody yeah. else? Oh, yeah, we got two bet there. Yeah. Um, so I was curious. I always see short story collections kind of like mixtapes in a way where yeah. the order and sequence is, is really important and can affect the, the flow and um, outcome of, of, the, of the reader. And I'm curious on how you order or sequence your, your stories in a collection like this one. Yeah, um, that's funny. That's exactly the analogy my editor used when we were going through and, and moving the stories around. Um, 
so the story collection that I sold, which I sold right after um, Cat Person Went Viral, had the current first story as its first story and had the last story as its last story. And that was something I felt really passionately about in terms of keeping the story collection, the arc of it, the same, even though I knew that people were going to come to it with a different set of expectations than they would have if they hadn't already read Cat Person. And that is true in particular because the story that is first um, is a pretty extreme story that moves very dramatically from sort of low stakes to high stakes and moves you into the horror realm fairly dramatically. And I felt that I had some, when I was having conversations with editors when the, when the collection was at auction, I had a f it was probably split whether people wanted me to keep that or that whether they wanted me to change it. And I cared, it, some people said, which I think was thoughtful, they were like, every collection teaches uh, its readers how to read it. And you're gonna have people coming with a certain set of expectations, and you can give them cat person first, and then sort of level up, and then level up, and so that by the middle of the collection, they're reading the more kind of horror-oriented or the darker stories, but they've gotten ready, they've gotten their feet under them. And that I think was in many ways a good advice. But Allison, and I also sort of agree with this, was like, there's another vision, which is just like, you trust the reader who are going to find your book to find it and to know what they want. And there was no part of me, and I guess you guys are maybe the one exception in that you bought books the day it came out, so you're about to find out. But I wanted people to know what book, what kind of book they were getting into and to have a sense right away that we were in a world where, um, where it the stakes were potentially high and where dark things could happen. And I felt like it was necessary, especially by the time you got to Cat Person. I think it's a really different story if you've had to reset your expectations of what might happen several times. And there are a couple of points in the story um, that, which I, like I said, I wrote imagining as part of this collection where Margot, um, you know, has these, these moments of fear and she's not quite sure where they come from and she doesn't know if they're realistic or whether she's being absurd. And I felt like, to me, like one of the themes in the story, this is sort of a long meandering answer, but was one of the themes of the story was how that is how we move through the world, that we have all these different stories in our heads, and some of them are true crime about murders that happen in our hometown, and some of them are television shows, and some of them are just things our friends told us, and all those stories have different stakes, and the moment where you're alone in a car with a man is a moment where maybe all those stories are coming into you right at once, and you're like, I don't know what story I'm in right now, I'm afraid, and I don't know if I'm being ridiculous or I'm not, and so I think in terms of order, what I wanted was an arc that kind of collectively kind of peeled back the layers of sort of certainty about what kind of story you were in and what stories, where a story might go. And that was the kind of trajectory I was most interested in. By the time I got to the two realist stories that are at, in the center, that you had been fully kind of like oriented to a world where anything could happen. So, yeah. Yeah, and like Biter, what she read, it's yeah. funny because that's sort of the inverse of that. I feel like a lot of these stories are about waiting for people to uh, let their fear or their wanting override their mm -hmm. social conditioning. Yeah, that's a great way of putting right. it. And actually. like, like Biter is like her trying to talk herself down from doing this thing that she knows she shouldn't, but she wants it more. Yeah, than like yeah. I mean, it's a story about someone who. Spoiler alert! Want something and gets it, and I <laughs> <laughs> and um, suppose she bites. yeah exactly. <laughs> and I, I did think, and I hope that the story can have that effect if it's working the way I want to have that feel like a kind of catharsis and a relief. And I'm really skeptical of like stories, stories with like ob obvious morals or stories where it's like the sort of classic short fiction ending where everyone's like, hmm, we've learned <laughs> something today. Like that's not necessarily the kind of satisfaction that I'm looking to give, but I do think I wanted, if you made it through this collection, which goes to a lot of dark places, I wanted you to have a story at the end that just sort of feels like you've stuck the landing and it's done and you're like getting off a roller coaster. Like that feeling to me is a great feeling when like the ground is under you again and like all the ups and downs are over and you just kind of landed safely. And so, uh, yeah, so that was the idea. We'll see if it works, I guess. Yeah. Um, uh, we have time for just a couple more questions, but there's one in the very back here. There was one, yeah. Hi. Uh, don't want to harp on cat person, like, oh, you know, like, like beating a dead mule kind of thing, <laughs> no. but like that's the reason I requested to work this event. Yeah. Um, and I kind of want to see if you'd enunciate a bit on like, so we talked about like people reading into things, things that aren't there in your stories, the political aspects of cat person yeah because all the women that suggested the story to me suggested it to me because we've all had that yeah. experience yeah. and when I read it 
I was like, oh no, he did not. Oh God. And I was, reliving, <laughs> and I was reliving experiences I had when I was the protagonist age yeah. with that person. And it, and it was so incredible to feel how visceral it was yeah. from your writing. But in this current environment, politically, how you feel as a woman writing these things yeah. that are in by nature intended or not political. Yeah. I would say I feel exposed. I think I when I was saying I need time to let to get enough away from whatever personal experiences have gone into a story. One of the reasons I need that is because I know that when the story goes out into the world, it will start to do that work. I'm not at all a person who's like story shouldn't be political. Like authors should keep themselves. I do think that as a writer, you can go political too early, that you can try too hard to tell people what to think, and then they pull back, and then you've lost them. But I do think in this current, in all, I mean, in every environment, but in this moment in particular, it's very hard to talk. I mean, we've had a kind of amazing moment, I think, of collective conversation. And that conversation has been powerful and it has been meaningful. It has not been easy for anyone. And I think as a fiction writer, having a story be a part of that larger moment, I feel both vulnerable and also just like glad that I was able to give people a fictional story to talk about because I feel like when I see people talking about like talking about personal essays I feel like we can't it's not almost it's not right to, to like t to dissect a story that's like from the first person in the same way that I do actually feel like I can give you this story and if you think Margot sucks like you have the right to think that like I might not agree but she isn't real so you can have those feelings and you can have those conversations and I think that's what I sort of mean by by giving the story away I think fiction can do that and I use it and it was funny like it's what I've used fiction for my whole life right to like understand the things that I couldn't understand any other way or to like experience first before I could understand them and explain them and like make sense of them first I felt them and I felt them through stories and I think I'm grateful to everyone who was able to in one way or another like take the leap into that story, which is a really uncomfortable space, and to be honest about what it brought up for them and also what parts rang true and what parts did not, and like which parts baffled them and which parts were like the moment where they pulled back. I think if you're doing that and you're reading a story and you're talking about it in good faith, like that's a great thing to do. And I, I feel really honored that I had the chance to be a part of that longer conversation. And my stepping back from it was not, like it was out of what I feel like was respect essentially that I was like I said I can't speak any better than my story can speak like I can't necessarily I can't articulate these things better than people are doing now as they read them and so yeah it was it was I mean it was emotionally it was very hard it was very intense um but in retrospect I feel really like grateful that I got a chance to do it so yeah any final question or comment right here Hi, I just have a quick question about um, what you mentioned with you know parts of your brain being more analytical and the other being more creative. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, from your bio it says that you've had a PhD in English. Yeah. Um, I think this question is less about your writing stories per se, but more about your career. Sure. I'm just curious to, to know like via anecdotes or whatever if your academic experience like influence your writing or do you think they're separate and like makes your life richer like. What, yeah. it, what was your experience with, with that? Yeah. Um, well, if everyone, if you're asking whether you should get a PhD, I would say probably not in this econ in this economy. Probably not. Um, yeah. It absolutely made my life richer. It shut down my fiction writing for a really long time because my analytical brain was high powered. And I do feel like there's a way that when you start knowing what can be wrong with a story, you can't write anything. And if the voice in your head is the voice of the person who's going to immediately go to your weakness and point it out, you're going to shut down. And that. Part of writing fiction is being vulnerable enough to potentially have made a mistake that a really smart person could point out. And if you are that smart person and you're standing there being like, this is wrong, you're going to freeze. That said, with time, it became incredibly meaningful to me because it meant that I got to read a lot of books. And I'm like, I was not, frankly, the most like diligent PhD student, but I did read a lot. And I read a lot of things that I wouldn't have read otherwise. And I read freely in a space for years that like I now look at my stories and I'm like, oh yeah, there's that, that book, there's that short story, there's that thing. And, and so I think more reading is always better, but that for me, my, yeah, my analytical brain can often be the enemy. 
And so it's about keeping it sort of res just the right amount of restrained. You know, it will try and run everything if you let it. So you have to figure out how not to. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Haley. Thank you, Kristen, for having this yeah, discussion with you. us tonight. Let's thank give them a you. round of applause. Thank you, guys.